my dear Christian friends. Uh, today, I would like to answer one of the most important question that any Christian would face. And perhaps you think to yourself, well, what is the most important question that many times demand an answer? You perhaps think, well, in my school, in my college, usually people ask questions, or even among my friends, they ask questions regard, well, is there is a creator? Um, who is God? Um, who is Jesus? Um, maybe you would think, well, maybe the question is, what must I do to be saved? Well, those are very important questions. But what would happen is this, after you answer the question, you will go something, well, because the Bible said. And uh, so usually the question, which is very legitimate after that, why the Bible? Why any other book? Why the writing of Buddha? Why any religious writing? Why the Bible? Why do you believe the Bible? And usually when we are asked that question, and again, especially in the academic hallways where there are professors who are just eager to engage student and they feel their mission is to deprogram them from any religious especially from the Bible. So you'll be sitting in a biology class or physics class or any class, philosophy class, and the professor would, and something will be mentioned and you raise your hand and you said, well, I object to that. And the professor said, why? And you say, well, because the Bible said, and the professor looked at you and said, um, so your authority in answering is the Bible. Why the Bible? Now I will tell you what general answer most Christian young people or most Christian give. The first answer usually is, well, I was raised up to be a Christian from my youth, from I was raised up this way. Christianity was everything to us. My parents told me that. And that's how I learned that there is a creator. And what you just said, addressing the professor, is not true. He, the professor will kind of grin, have a little smile on his face and said, hmm. So because your parents told you, well, I would think that having gone through elementary school, high school, and here you are in college, do you really believe in what your parents told you? Seriously? You remember when you were a little kid and your parents will tell you, don't go outside when it's cold without a hat, otherwise you will catch cold. And then you will discover later on that you catch a cold because it's a virus and a virus doesn't go through the skull of your head. So having a hat or having a no hat doesn't do anything. And yet you believe them. I'll give you another one. How about Santa Claus? Did your parents and you believe them? Seriously? Do you really believe your, what your parents told you? Your parents are fallible. And now what you do? So that is the answer that doesn't take you anywhere. Because, well, how about somebody else? His parents raised him under a different religion, using a different book. That's how he was raised. That's how he brought up. 
How about the person that his parents wrote, raised him up to be an atheist? So if your argument that you were raised up this way, your logic is not going to take you anywhere because somebody else could be raised as an atheist and don't believe what are you relying on, the Bible. Because if you believe the Bible because you are raised up this way, this is a very poor argument. Okay, now you are thinking, my dear friend, like, all right, I know a better answer than that. I believe the Bible because I experience it. I read it and it changed my life. Now we are living in a society where nobody could argue with experience. Well, that's your experience. Wonderful. So you read it and it changed your life. Good for you. How about somebody who went to some holy place and get this religious feeling and came back from that pilgrimage stopped smoking, drug use, whatever, 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 drink, whatever, whatever, and changed his life completely. I tell you a story, actually, of somebody, and he wrote his bi biography, who actually was, I think, was born in the Midwest, maybe in Michigan. Um, his mother was ill mentally. His father got murdered when he was young. He was sent to live with his sister in Massachusetts, in Boston. As a young man, he, teenager, ran with the wrong crowd and um, went to jail. And he was an awful prisoner. And then, and then, and then, they told him he had to meet this guy. This guy is going to change his life completely. And one day in his cell, he met this guy. He wrote that in his biography. And he bowed the knee. He changed his life completely. He was a model prisoner. He was released early. He established hundreds of houses of worship, streets named after him. And then he discovered that this guy that he met was a fraud. The whole thing was a fraud. He left that. And the group that he was with, that he discovered was all fraud. And he left them, they assassinate him. I'm sure you know who I'm talking about, Malcolm X. He had an experience. Well, how about the guy that goes to Alcoholics Anonymous and, you know, step number four, or he have to claim pow higher power. And then he decide that, you know, there is a light outside of his room that goes on and off all the time. He's going to take that as his guidance. And because of that, he stopped drinking. His life has changed completely. So why is your experience different than all of these guys? They have an experience. It changed the life. It made them a model citizen. But your experience and somebody else's experience well, so that's your experience. Must somebody have a complete opposite experience? Is that why you want to have the Bible as your authority? So now what? You're probably saying to yourself, well, you took the two best answers I have. You better have, give me an answer. I'll give you an answer. And I'll show you where that answer comes from. The question to me is, why do you believe the Bible? I believe the Bible because it is, and I'm going to say it very slowly, a reliable collection of historical document written down by eyewitnesses during the lifetime of eyewitnesses. They describe supernatural events that have taken place in fulfillment of prophecy and they claim that the writing 
is divine and not human in origin. A reliable collection of historical document written by eyewitnesses during the lifetime of other eyewitnesses. They record supernatural events that have taken place in fulfilling of a specific prophecy and they claim that the writing is divine in origin and not human. Let me break it up to you. We're going to take it. But I'm going to tell you where I get it from. Open your Bible with me to 2 Peter <clears throat> chapter 1. And I am going to read from verse 16. Now, perhaps as you open your Bible with me to look at those verses, um, I'm sure somebody who have some philosophy training or logic training is going to say, wait a second, you can't do that. You could not defend the Bible using the Bible. That is a circular reasoning. I'm not defending the Bible. I would no more defend the Bible than I defend the lion. I don't defend the lion. I think Charles Spurgeon said that. I'll let the lion loose. The lion defend himself. I am not here to defend the Bible. I am here to answer the question that you're asking me. Why do you believe the Bible? And I told you the statement, and I tell you where I'm getting it from. This is in my own words, or I heard many, many people who spoke about that, and I just tried to put it together for you. So let me read to you from the Holy Bible, from the second epistle of Peter, and I will read from verse 16, and I will be reading um, from a translation called John Nelson Darby translation or the New Translation. Um, you could read the same thing in the King James Version or any other, other version because we're going to talk about that later on. Verse 16, first, uh, sorry, 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 16. For we have not made known to you the power and the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, following cleverly imagined fable, but having been an eyewitnesses of his majesty. For he received from God the Father honor and glory, such a voice being uttered to him by the excellent glory. This is my beloved Son, in whom I have found my delight. And this voice we heard uttered from heaven, being with him on the holy mountain. And we have the prophetic word made surer, to which we do well taking heed as a lamp shining in a secure place until the dawn until the day dawn and the morning star rise in your heart knowing this first that the scope of no prophecy of, of the scripture is had from its own particular interpretation for prophecy was not ever uttered by the will of man but holy men of God speak under the power of the Holy Spirit. I read the whole section because actually that is what, I, what I state, my statement came from. What we said, it is a collection of historical document. You see, the Bible is not one book written by one man that claim that God spoke to him. Well, the Bible is one book, but it is 66 volume, 66 volume. It's not just one book that somebody claimed God talked to him and he wrote it down or he said it, recital it or something. And then his followers, you know, hundreds of years later wrote it down. That's not the Bible. The Bible is 66 books written by over 40 authors in a span of, of 1,500 years, 
1,500 years. It is written on three continents. It is written in three languages, mainly Hebrew, Greek, and a little bit of Aramaic. I used to teach my Sunday school kids that how many chapters are in the Bible? Sometimes I ask them how many verses, but chapter and verses came in later. 66 books, 66 volumes, 1,189 chapters, just for you to know. But it covers different kind of subject, over 100 kind of subject. It is written by kings, by shepherd, by doctors, by philosopher, by historian, by generals. It is written by people from all walk of life. Some of them have never met, a, met um, the other person. So it is a collection of historical, reliable historical documents. It is written by eyewitnesses. And that's really, really important. This volume of books in one book called the Holy Bible is written by eyewitnesses. I read to you the verse in first. Uh, in 2 Peter chapter 1, it said there, For we have not uh, following cleverly imaginable fable, but having been eyewitnesses. Eyewitnesses. To me, it's really, really important. It is really important. If you have a case that you want to solve, the best way to solve it is have eyewitnesses. Have eyewitnesses that their story will collaborate with each other. I want you to imagine that if you walk to, into a prison and ask a prisoner, um, if I get you 20 eyewitnesses that prove your story, would you be here? He probably would tell you if you get me three, if you get me two eyewitnesses that collaborate my story, I would be free. Well, I'm going to talk about, about the eyewitnesses. I want you to turn Again, and I, again, I'm using the word of God. You see, I am using the Bible to prove to you why I believe the Bible. Again, because I cannot claim a higher authority. See, if I use something else to prove the Bible, then I'm claiming there is something that has higher authority than the Bible. But I am telling you, I don't have any higher authority than the Bible, the word of God. So turn with me to the Gospel of Luke. Again, we are staying it's a, it is a, it is a, a collective. It is a, um, a, a document, a collection of his, of document, um, historical document written by eyewitnesses. I'm gonna go to Luke chapter one, and I'm gonna read to you what Luke wrote. Now, Luke to me is a very fascinating person. He was a physician. Doctors are usually known and trained for their keen observation. You go to the doctor. He look at you. He asks you question. He doesn't just look at your blood work or your CT scan or MRI or whatever. He look at you and he asks you question. When, when, how, did. And based on that, he form an opinion. Doctors are usually very good historians because of the ability of observation. So I'm going to read what Dr. Luke is saying in his gospel, in the gospel written by Dr. Luke. And we have in the scripture four gospel. And you might ask the question, why four gospels? Is this contradiction? Uh, uh, con uh, are they contradict each other? No, they complement each other. They're all speaking about the same person. But that person is so great. You know, when you go to the uh, um, the IMAX theater, they give you a glasses to see things 3D, three dimension. That is the best that man could see. Well, the Lord Jesus is so great that we have four dimensions. We have four gospels. Every one of them speaks of him from certain angle, but that's, for some other time. So now let's go and read chapter one and verse one. And I'm going to read again from the new trans uh, from Darby's translation. You could read it the same from the King James or the new King James. For as much as many have undertaken to draw up a relation concerning the matters fully believed among us, as those who from the beginning were eyewitnesses, again, I'm going back to eyewitnesses, of and attendance. Not only they saw, they were very close. 
to the world, which is the Lord Jesus, who is the Lord Jesus, have delivered them to us. It seems good to me. He was just didn't want to take man's word for it. He wanted to do his own investigation. It seems good to me also accurately acquainted from the origin with all things to write to thee with a method. Most excellent Theophilus, I'm going to write to you with method. Most excellent Theophilus. So apparently there is, he's writing to a very intelligent man, very intellectual man, man who is very, very cu curious, who believe, but he wanted an assurance. Thou, you may know the certainty of these things in which thou hast been instructed. He didn't write so you might have a blind faith. Of the things that you have heard. This historian, Dr. Luke, is writing with a method. This is to me like um, a proposal of, re of a research. If you work with universities, I do, and you get proposal from graduate student, they write a proposal. So here is a proposal of a research. I am going to do this and I'm going to follow with method based on this hypothesis, uh, hypothesis that I know to prove it or to disprove it. I want you to have a certainty in a very scientific, intellectual way. And I'm, this is wonderful. And by the way, all I'm telling you, unless you really, and we'll talk about that in the end, does the Lord Jesus, um, it's just an intellectual argument. But I'm talking to you to help you when you speak to your friends or to your professor to speak at the level. So Luke saying, I'm going to follow a method and I'm going to follow all of the events. It's really amazing when you read um, in chap about Luke. Um, so if I go to chapter two, and I want to read verse, and I'll tell you why I'm reading that, verses chapter two and verse one. And it came to pass in those days that there went out a decree from Caesar Augustus that all of the world should be taxed. And this ta taxing or registration was first when Cornelius was the governor of Syria. Remember that name because we'll, I'll get back to it later on. Let me go to chapter three. Look at look at look at the detail, the method that he's writing, the events, the names, and the places. I'll go to chapter three now. In the fifteenth year of the reign of Tiberius Caesar, Pontius Pilate, being governor of or of Judea. And Herod being the Tetrarch of Galilee, and his brother Philip the Tetrarch of Eteresia, and uh, of the region of Trichonis, and Listinius is the Tetrarch of Alabina. Annas and Caiaphas being the high priest, the word of God came into John, the son of Zechariah, in the wilderness. Look at these details. Why do you have to write all of these names? This guy was the governor of this, and this guy was the governor of this, and those were two as a high priest, and this has happened in that place in the time of Tiberius. Historical event written by someone who has investigated what the eyewitnesses have seen. Actually, Sir um, William Ramsey, a very well known archaeologist and historian, he followed did a lot of digging in the in the around the Mediterranean area. And he as he follow even the book of Acts because I didn't want to for the time sake to read the first verses of the book of Acts because it's again the same thing. He's writing to the same person and he is giving him historical events and a journey. It's amazing, sir um Edward uh, William uh, Ramsey said that in Luke he mentioned 32 countries in his writing. 54 cities, nine islands, everything accurate as a team. Mention names, mention storms, mention ports, mention in the book of Acts, very detailed. Like sometimes you say to yourself, well, if you put that much detail, you are in a danger because you might make a mistake. Everything was done in a perfect way. I am highlighting again, it's a collection of historical documents 
written by eyewitnesses. Let me go to another one. I want to go to 1 John, and I want to read the epistle of 1 John, right? talking to you, Christian, that you should know your Bible. So let's go there, and again, let's see what he said. Chapter 1 and verse 1. That which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked upon, and our handle have handled of the word of life. See, heard, touch. It is a man who is writing that perhaps the year 980 and saying all of that. People were still living who have seen these things. Eyewitnesses during the lifetime of eyewitnessing. Let me go back to first. Um, Go back again. I'm going backwards here to 1 Corinthians chapter 15. And that is to me such an amazing thing. Again, I'm highlighting the fact that these were written by eyewitnesses during the lifetime of eyewitnesses. So I'll go to 1 Corinthians chapter 15. And here is the apostle Paul because you know what? I find it very interesting, um, dear listener, that it seems like this question been coming all the time. All the time, since the time of the apostle. So the year this epistle was written in First Corinthians, perhaps 57 AD, you know, 40 years after Lord Jesus was risen from among the dead, or around that time, a lot of people were still around. What what is uh, what is uh, the writer, the apostle Paul saying? Um, moreover, brethren, I'm going to read from verse 1, chapter 15 of 1 Corinthians. I declare unto you the gospel which I preach unto you, which also you have received, and wherein you stand, by which you also saved, if you keep in memory what I preach unto you, unless you believed in vain. For I deliver unto you first of all that which I received, how that Christ died for our sins according to the scripture. And he was buried, and that he rose again on the third day according to the scripture. Now, listen to this. And he was seen of Cephas, that's Peter, then of the twelve. After that, he was seen of above 500 brethren. I'll read it one more time. After that, he was seen above of, of above 500 brethren at once, of whom the greater part remain until this present, but some are fallen asleep or died. Five, well, okay. He said he was seen by 500. He see, was seen by Peter. He was seen by the 12. And you might ask yourself a question. Well, wait a second. Wait, 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 wait. But by the 12. I thought Judas hang himself. How could you use that? Hmm. Well, that might be a problem, but unless you you really read your Bible, because if you read in the book of Acts, chapter one, they chose one, Matthias, to be part of the twelve. And what was the prerequisite? That he saw the Lord during his life. And he also witnessed the resurrection. If you read chapter one, that he was an eyewitness of the resurrection and he was part of the 12. So he, he was seen by the 12. Scripture is so accurate. But now I, I want to go to those 500 that were eyewitnesses of a resurrected man. If I go to the courtroom and have I, I, 500 eyewitnesses with me to prove my case. I don't need lawyers. I have it all. But you know what he said? He said most of them, um, most of them uh, are still alive. If he said half of them are still alive, then we have 250 witnesses. But he said the big part of them, you know, the majority of them. So there are 300, there are 400 in the year 57, 61. Or eyewitnesses have seen a risen man that talked to them. As a matter of fact, for 40 days, it's not like, oh, a second I saw something and it disappeared. 
For 40 days, he was with them. And he wasn't just with them appearing and disappearing. He was speaking and teaching them. There was a Bible class going on for 40 days by the teacher explaining to them everything. Why these men who, when they took the Lord Jesus to crucify him, they all fled. Peter denied him. And after he was buried, they were sitting in a room, locking the doors, are so terrified. They were terrified from their shadow. Look at Peter standing up in the book of Acts. In front, 3,000 souls, maybe more, because 3,000 souls got saved. And witness of the resurrection of Christ. Don't you think anybody could say, wait a second here. Wait, wait, wait. He's not risen. They couldn't produce his body. You telling me that in Jerusalem, where the Roman soldier knew every corner, they were better than the CIA and the M6 and whatever intelligent group. They know every corner in Jerusalem. They couldn't produce the body. I mean, that was the, the easiest thing to do. What are you, resurrected? Here he is. They couldn't, at that time, when these things were written, they were written by eyewitnesses during the lifetime of eyewitnesses. To prove that the Bible is true. To prove that these historical events have taken place to fulfill a certain prophecy. So it's a collection of his historical document written by eyewitnesses in during the lifetime of other eyewitnesses. Well, we can we go back again to First Peter because that's where my thesis really and what I am bringing for you. So what else does he say? He have said in Second Peter chapter one. So, and he said, um. We are, but we were, verse uh, verse 16, we were eyewitnesses of his majesty, for he received from God the Father honor and glory. And then he goes into verse um, 19, and we have also more sure word of prophecy. This historical document were written to Proof a fulfillment of specific prophecy. Now, prophecy is something that happened in the past. And now, prophecy is not this nonsense that sometimes you see on TV, somebody standing up and said, you know, I know somebody in this room have a back problem. You know what? If I sit in a room with 100 people in there and ask a question, does any of you have a back problem? I'm sure I'll get a few hands. So this is not prophecy. It's just, uh, I don't know what to, what to say. But what are we talking about is something that happened and it came to pass. There is a lot of, I mentioned Sir uh, William Ramsey, there is archaeologists, like archaeo over 2,500 archaeologists, sorry, 25,000 archaeologists dig discovery over 25,000, and none of them, none of them contradict the scripture. It's actually fascinating because many times you read the Bible. This uh, Cornelius in Luke chapter 2, we don't have, any, uh, that's nonsense. We, there was no such a thing. And then they go and dig and find him. They don't come back and say, oh, we're sorry, uh, you know, we made a mistake. Oh, fine. We'll find something else. I'll give you a, I'll give you just a, a simple example. And it was for a long, long time uh, in Daniel chapter five in the Old Testament. And the book of Daniel is just, it's a fascinating thing. The detail of things that were going to happen when he write about the Greek, when he, the Persian and the Mede are still in control. Nobody heard of the Greek. And he writes about them 300 years before Alexander the Great 
come. As a matter of fact, when Alexander the Great were conquering everything and came to Jerusalem, the chief rabbi came out to meet him with the prophecy of Daniel. And he said, it's written about you before you were born. Alexander was so impressed that he kind of exempt them from taxes and gives them freedom for, for everything. You go to chapter 11 and the details about the kings and the kingdom around Israel, the details of it. That's why people, oh, it was written after that. Seriously? Seriously? In chapter 5 especially, there was King Belshazzar. Remember the writing on the wall? Everybody used that expression. The writing on the wall, by the way, it came from the Bible. Okay. Archaeology found Nebuchadnezzar. the Nebuchadnezzar. They, they never find any anybody called Belshazzar. Many said, ah, it's nonsense. It's man-made thing. And then I think it was 1854 or so. Um, one of the archaeologists, Herbert Rollinson, Herbert Rollinson, found a tablet in Iraq where Belshazzar's name is mentioned and his father was mentioned because his father, who is the son of Nebuchadnezzar, was in a military camping and he put his son, Belshazzar, in charge. That's why it said there to Daniel, he, he, that King Belshazzar told Daniel, if you interpret the writing on the wall, you'll be third in the kingdom because Belshazzar was second in the kingdom. How accurate, historically. And by the way, I just want to make a, a clear comment that the Bible is not a history book. The Bible is not a science book. I don't teach science from the Bible. But every scientific fact and every historical fact mentioned in the Bible is true. And again, I'm appealing to the Bible because there is no higher authority. So now you say, okay, fine, fine. But, you know, you're talking about the Bible. You're talking about historical doc document. You're talking about prophecy. But, but we don't have the original. We don't, we don't have these original documents, do we? And I'm going to stick with the New Testament for a little bit. Um, it's interesting when people throw that thing. You know, what we have in our hand is, is not the original. It's a translation. Okay. There is about 6,000 manuscript or part of manuscript of the New Testament, 6,000. The earlier, the earliest of them date between the year 100 and 120 AD. So in the, for the first seven, 70 years after the resurrection of the Lord Jesus, you have documentation written by eyewitnesses. There's 6,000 of them. Just to put things in perspective, and I have a few facts here I would like to share with you. So the New Testament in Greek, we have about 6,000 manuscripts. Let's go in history and look, because you could say, well, so that's not a big deal. If you say that you really have no idea how ancient writing is dated or value. So let's go to, for example, um, the poetic, uh, well, let me start with the war of Julius Caesar. The war of Julius Caesar, the Gallic war of Julius Caesar. Do you know how many original manuscripts that we have? 12. Remember, Greek, New Testament, 6,000. Julius Caesar, Gallic war, 12. You know what is the earliest date, the, the oldest manuscript that we have when it was written? A thousand years after his death. A thousand years after his death, 12 of them. How about the, what should I use? Aristotle poetic? Maybe a dozen of them or less. The earliest that we have? 
a thousand years. That's the oldest, a thousand years after their death. How about so Socrates? How much writing of we have of Socrates? Zero. How do we know about him? Pluto wrote about him. We don't have any of his writing. That's that's how value. Okay, I'll give you one that is really known: the the Iliads by Homer. This is the one we have. A couple hundred of document. Remember, Iliad, Homer, a couple of hundred of document. Greek New Testament, six thousand document or part of document. And the earliest that we have of Eliot's Homer, Homer or written 2,100 years after his death. I mean, this is ancient manuscript in the people who study these things. So put all of that together and look at what I'm telling you. 6,000 written by the year 100, 120 at most. These are historical facts that could not be denied. I'm not just telling you stuff. You could go and test everything I'm saying. But when you answer your professors, it's not because you are raised this way or not because you experience this way. We'll get to that later on. But I am just in pure facts here. Pure, pure fact from the word of God itself. And there is evidence out there for it. So now people say, okay, fine. But you know what you have today is not that because of translation. I, I told you I'm going to read from this translation. You could read from that translation. Okay. So, you know, the translation are very modern and, uh, you know, you cannot rely on the Bible because it's just a translation of things. Who knows what? People who say that they are either ignorant or evil. Because if I am, for example, if I, the people that translate the Bible into English, Let's start with the King James translation. Did they go back to the Geneva Bible, which you probably see behind me here, and took that and translated from the Geneva Bible into the English King James? And did the new King James people took the old King James and then translated from there? This is not the game of the, uh, of the telephone that the kids play. I tell you a story and then you tell it to this person and he tells it to this person and he tells it to this person. And by the time it comes back to you, it's a totally different story. No, everyone went to the original manuscript. So I'll tell you the story and I tell him the story and I tell him the story and I tell him the story. They came from the same source. They came from the same source. So there is no such a thing. Oh, it's all different translation. Which translation? Listen, learn Greek and Hebrew and read it. There's computer programs now that could authenticate that stuff. So people who say that stuff, again, they might be standing with five PhDs in a different subject. But I'm telling you, they're either ignorant or evil or both. So this argument about, oh, translation, because that's why the Bible is not reliable. No, has nothing to do with the translation. But then, then there is the other one, which I have heard it once, which fascinating thing. Oh, uh, the conspiracy theory of the monks in the time of Constantine. You see, Constantine got these group of monks and said, listen, you got you to gotta start fixing things here. So that theory goes something like that, which is actually, it's like a fantasy or a movie thing or a novel. And I'm sure you probably know what I'm talking about. I'm not mentioning names about people who wrote these things. Okay, here is, here is, here is the conspiracy theory. So these monks need to go and find 6,000 Greek manuscript and change every one of them, insert the line there, don't show your ink, don't show your work, don't tell anybody, and then go and put them back again where you got them from. There is another problem. By that time, because Christian went everywhere telling the gospel message, people got converted from every nation, from every tongue. So what happened? By the year 200, 300 AD, you have 
Bibles in not only in Greek, but in Syriac, in Coptic, and in Latin. So you monks need to go now and not only get the 6,000 manuscript or portion of manuscript and change all of them. Don't show your ink. Don't tell anybody you did that. Put them back where you got them from. But then you have to go and get the Syriac, the Coptic, and the Latin and do the same thing again. Take them from everywhere, collect them, change them. Don't tell anybody you did that. Don't show a new ink on them and just put them back again. That's the second problem that you will have with that theory. Well, the third one, the church's fathers, those were the men that lived after the time of the apostle, perhaps from the year 100 AD to 200 or so, 300. They have a habit of writing commentary on the Bible. And I'm sticking still with the New Testament because that's what I want you to focus on. So now what you have to do, not only collect all of the Greek manuscript and change them, collect all of the translation into uh, Coptic, Sir, uh, Syriac, and, um, and Latin and change them. Now go and collect all of the writing of the church's father, all of the commentaries that they wrote on the New Testament, and pick every verse in there and change it. I think someone said that if we have no manuscript of the New Testament, we could put it all the New Testament all together from the church's father's writing, except 11 verses. You could put the New Testament all together except 11 verses from the writing of the church's father. So this whole Constantine and the monks that went around, I mean, this is a movie stuff. This is like those novel things that trying to prove some. It's it's nonsense. And it's going to take them 300 years to do all of this. Imagine, can somebody do that? You know, that's mission impossible. It cannot be done. It cannot be done. So this whole theory of that, the translation theory is nonsense because we go back to the original. The idea that the, the manuscript were corrupted by these monks during the time of Constantine, it's just like, um, again, it's a, it's a fiction. It's a fiction. And I'm telling you why. And I'm using logic and reason to tell you why the Bible, why I believe the Bible. It's a reliable collection of historical document written by eyewitnesses during the time of eyewitnesses. Two, tell us about the fulfillment of prophecy that was written years prior to that. I mentioned the book of Daniel. I want to mention... Um, Isaiah 53, it's a prophecy. And he writes there about in the book of Isaiah about the birth of the Lord Jesus. We are around Christmas time, perhaps. And around Christmas time, unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given. <laughs> Written right there in Isaiah. He spoke about the coming of the Lord Jesus, his birth. 700 years before the Lord Jesus was born. You know what's funny? When the Lord Jesus was born, and I'm sure every Christian during the Christmas time, they read the scripture. And you, Bethlehem Ephrata, are not the least of the thousands of Judah. When Herod asked a question, when the wise man came to him, he got all of the scribe and the Pharisees. Hey, what's going on? These people are coming here to tell me there is a king. Where is he that is born king of the Jews? What, is he, what are they talking about? You know what these guys? They know it very well. They didn't say, okay, hold on a second. Let's go and study. He said, yeah, it's written. And they quote the verse that is in Micah. So everything, his birth, where he will be born, his miracles, his life, his death, it was all prophesied by. You know, people wrote about the Lord Jesus healing the sick. I mean, nobody, had, when when Matthew or Mark or Luke wrote their gospel or John, somebody said, wait a second, you talk about the blind man, Bartimaeus, we know him. There is no such a thing. I mean, they're writing the name and the events. So somebody could say, 
what are you talking about? I'm around. I I lived at that time. I lived in that town. There was no Bartimaeus that blind or somebody about Jer uh, by Jericho. There was no man has a lesion in him, thousand of 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 demon. There was no Lazarus that died and the Lord, Lord Jesus raised him up. They recording names, events, villages, towns, everything in detail. It was written during the life. Somebody could have written a book said, that's nonsense. That didn't happen. Nobody refuted what was written. The miracles of the Lord Jesus. But I'm talking about his birth, his death. 700 years is not good for you because that's Isaiah. How about if I talk you to Psalm 22, written a thousand years before the Lord Jesus was born, describing his crucifixion? I want you to turn to that psalm and read it. I am not because of the time's sake. But read that psalm, especially the verses that said, they pierce my hand and my feet. Now, David, who wrote that psalm, never, ever, ever heard of the crucifixion because it wasn't invented. The Roman invented that. He's talking about the dogs attacking me. And any Jewish person know what is that dog's reference to? They consider everybody else who is not a Jew a dog, the Romans. Malefactors that surrounded him. How did David know that? David, while David was writing about himself, David never had his, his hand and his feet pierced. But the amazing, amazing, amazing thing, what these witnesses wrote, the fulfillment of prophecy, not only because the Lord Jesus said himself, owed Christ not to suffer first and enter into his glory. In Luke 24, he was walking with two who was completely depressed because the Lord, we have hope that he is the one who is going to redeem Israel, they said. And he took them from Moses, the Psalms, the prophets, to show them those were prophecy that being fulfilled. And they were eyewitnesses of these fulfilling prophecy. You know, in First Peter, we read that we have the sure word of prophecy and where we will, where unto you do well that you take heed as unto a light in a shining dark place until the day dawn and and the day star rise in your heart. This is like a light. You know, when you are in a very, very dark space and you see a light, uh, the human eye could see a mile. If it's completely dark and there is a light, you see it a mile away. And what they're saying here, this prophecy a light. And you want to follow it like Luke did. He want to investigate that to see if these things are true or not. I told you the amount of eyewitnesses, the amount of archaeologists take, the amount of manuscript, all of these things to make me believe that the authority I rely to answer any question is the Bible. But not only that, these men claim that the writing is not human in origin, but divine. Peter said that we have heard a voice. They heard the voice of God. The voice of God. And that's, by the way, again, not just one guy said, I heard the voice of God and he's telling me this and I'm writing it down. These are collective people. Some of them have not seen each other. Moses didn't see Peter. Well, an amount of transfiguration, Peter saw Moses. But they didn't sit together and say, all right, what are we going to write here? Or Mark, Luke, and Matthew, and, and, and John didn't sit together and say, okay, let's just sit together and how are we going to... Perhaps these guys never seen each other. Perhaps Luke didn't see Matthew or Mark. The argument about that the Bible is not the word of God or it's a man written something. Well, I don't believe it. It's a man written something. Okay, so you don't believe anything man is written, right? So go home and take all of the books that you have in your in your library or in, on your bookshelf and burn them because they're all man written. I mean, come on. How many things we get from some guru or some, you know, how or something and you just like, it's man written and you believe it. 
He tell you, oh, I use this medicine or this vitamin or and it did that, and you believe it, it's man written. And most of the time that stuff becomes fake. But here it is, the word of God standing throughout all of the generation. It's the most translated book in the world. It's the most sold book in the world. There's over 5 billion copies, maybe more, of this book that was sold. No book was under attack. Nobody attacked chemistry books or even philosophy books like this book. And no book withstand the time but this book. But now I'm going to end up with this. You said to me, okay, great. But I'm a scientist. I'm a science man. I believe in science. So you need to talk science to me. When people tell me that, and, and by the way, in my job, I work with PhDs and I work with universities and I work with students. So this whole idea, I'm a science guy. So when people tell me that, I said, okay, what are the science method improving anything? It has to be observed, measure, and repeated. So observable, measurable, repeatable. That's science. Can I use that to prove that the first president of the United States was George Washington using the scientific method? It's not observable. It's not measurable. And definitely it's not repeatable. So I don't use that. This is a wrong measuring stick for that argument. It doesn't work this way. But what do I use? I use the evident method. Not the scientific method. The scientific method has its application. But I use the evident-based method. And what is the evident-based method? Internal, external, and it has to collaborate. Somebody said something, I want to collaborate with that. And if I get 300 witnesses that have seen something and their story collaborate together, I have a good case. I want to end up with this. I believe the Bible because it is a collection of historical documents written by eyewitnesses during the lifetime of eyewitnesses. It records to us, it reports to us specific evidence specific fulfillment of a specific prophecy that have spoken about by men of God. By men of God, not one man. And these men claim that the writing is divine in origin, not human. And that is the last part in first um, in Second Peter chapter one that I read to you, that these men spoke in the power of the Holy Spirit. The Spirit of God, dear believer, have took hold of these people. I always um, use that expression. I'm going to get a pen and show you. So who wrote, I'm holding a pen here in my hand. Who wrote the Gospel of Matthew? Matthew writing the Gospel. But if I take this hand, if a friend of mine take this hand and just hold it like this and write, who wrote? I wrote, it's my style of writing, but who really dictated? I used to have a friend named Matthew, and I tell my I use him as okay, Matthew's writing, but I'm holding his hand up. It's exactly what it is. These men didn't have an imagination. What that's what uh, Peter said. We did not follow fable or imaginable thing. Luke said, I follow his method to reach to that thing. And that's why I believe in the Bible. And by the way, it changed my life. Experience it. In the beginning of my talk, I told you, I cannot rely on that. But I'm giving you the evidence why I believe it. And it changed my life. Anybody else don't have the evidence that I have. Anybody else have no evidence, no defense that what I have to def not to defend, I'm not defending the line. But to tell you why I believe the Bible that is the word of God, 
may God, I want to read that verse in, I want to finish with that in First Timothy, sorry, Second Timothy 3.16, maybe I will leave it for you to read it. It said there in First Timothy 3, um, Second, sorry, Second Timothy three sixteen. It said, "All the Scripture is God breathed, inspired of God, and it's part of profitable." Let me just read it so, and I will end with that for you. That is Second Timothy because I was quoting it from my head, but I want to make sure I don't use words that were not written there. So we go to 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16. There are many 3.16s in the Bible, and 2 Timothy 3.16 is one of them. It said there, all scripture is given by inspiration of God, and it's profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction and righteousness, that the man of God may be <clears throat> perfected through, thoroughly furnished, unto all good work. So here is my last word to you. Read your Bible. Pray every day. And you'll grow, grow, grow. I hope what I told you today will whet your appetite. Raise your curiosity. Check it out. Read your Bible. And God bless you. Thank you very much for listening to me.